Okay, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me without a mic? Yeah. Okay, I'm perfect. No, no, I'm good. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce you guys to Virginia Melnick. Um, Virginia got her bachelor's degree in architecture at the University of Buffalo, her master's in architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. She's currently working towards her PhD at Coastal University in Digital Futures. She's taught at the University of Clemson, University of Buffalo, and she's assistant with the Columbia University Study Abroad with the Studio X Beijing, and she's taught at the University of Pennsylvania. She has worked in numerous, okay. oh, numerous cities general. in Beijing, in New York, and Philadelphia, and she's participated in exhibitions of her work in multiple countries. Um, please welcome our first foundation fellow, Virginia Mellon. Uh, thank you. I'm going to adjust the lights here just to make it a little bit uh, dimmer so you can see the presentation. Uh, and yeah, the Captions are on and the microphone is on. Can you hear me? All right, perfect. Uh, so uh, I'm Virginia Allen Melnick, and today I want to speak about my work, and I wanted to give you a bit more background of my work, focusing not only on the kind of recent glossy images, but also giving you some of my process work um, and a storyline through how I got to where I am now. Um, and so that means some of these images are old. Um, some of them are taken with my iPhone 3, uh, so they may be blurry and really poor resolution. So I apologize in advance, but just use your imagination um, as you look at them. Uh, so textiles has been a part of my life uh, since I was a child. Uh, my family is from the Ukraine and emigrated to the States in the early 1800 or early 1900s, late 1800s, uh, and my great grandmother and my grandmother all worked at the Monarch Textile Factory in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and so, learning to weave and sew and knit was part of my childhood experience, as it was something that my family has been doing as a career, but also as culturally significant to um, our Slavic heritage in Ukraine. Uh, when I began to study architecture, I started to look at how I could integrate these experiences from my own childhood here into my architectural work. And that wasn't always possible, but it's definitely becoming more and more integrated as I continue to do research. Um, so early on in my career, I was very interested in grasshopper and aggregating components or aggregate parts. And it really has to do with a lot of looking at pieces and parts becoming a whole or becoming a design and a pattern. So one of my earliest projects that I built by myself while I was still working at offices, um, just kind of on a whim, I entered a competition um, to build this little hut in a park uh, in Toronto. And what I used was found objects. So I was really interested in using things that I could find, get cheaply, because I had no money. I was like just graduated from school. Uh, so I took plotter tubes from the print shop. That, there was an architectural print shop um, in my parents' office building. Uh, and I took tubes from the carpet store when they were throwing out their trash. Um, the carpets were all rolled up on these tubes. And I like knocked on their door and was like, hey, can I get some tubes? And I assembled this structure. Uh, the design was created using grasshopper and aggregating a series of circles um, using a circle packing method. And this, I used the different sizes of the tubes that I could find to help create that pattern. Uh, and then it was brought to Toronto on the back of my dad's truck. Um, and it had to be brought in a disassembled position because uh, the whole thing put together wouldn't fit on the truck bed. So I had to make it in. Uh, three sections that I could then assemble on site. Uh, and here it is, you know, being propped up by a ladder on its side. Um, and then ultimately, you can see these kind of patterns and textures and repeating shapes that I was really interested in uh, in the design and the kind of lighting effects that come through the holes of the tubes. The next project that I worked on with aggregative parts, again, trying to use found objects or off the shelf um, products was this hula hoop structure that was based on um, dodecahedrons that could be clustered and stacked together. Uh, and so those shapes uh, fit together and stack. 
and it becomes this kind of porous but layered effect as you see the lines are darker in the center because there's a higher density of hula hoops and they get lighter as they go out because there's only one or two rows of the structure. Sorry, it's loading slowly. And that was the uh, results there of the kind of uh, quality of texture pattern layering and shadows that resulted from these hula hoops and the kind of mess and web work that they created. Um, so these projects are fairly early, um, but this project was the one that I got a lot of recognition for uh, and was built out of inflatable tubes just like you would use um, at your swimming pool. And this was while I was living in Beijing working. I found an art festival and submitted a design to collaborate with them for this project. And it's just a dome shape. And to make this kind of dome shape, you can see there's two different sizes shown in the um, hexagons here, which are the kind of edges that the circle connects at. And it's a large inflatable and a small inflatable in this kind of pattern. And to get to that nitty gritty, again, I'm building it in my apartment in Beijing um, because I didn't have workspace. I didn't have anywhere to do this. So literally, it was wall to wall in my apartment to make sure it worked before I went on site um, and the day of the festival. Uh, and so here it is at the festival, which was this art festival um, held at Stephen Hall's Link Hybrid. And so there's the little pavilion. And then again, I was really interested in the way that the light comes through it. Um, views are obstructed or framed, and as well as how it feels to be immersed in this kind of color and quality and texture. Uh, furthering these explorations in color and light and texture and pattern, um, I made this window front in Toronto. So I moved back to the States after living in Beijing for almost three and a half years. And Toronto is the next biggest city to Buffalo where I was teaching at that time. And using Grasshopper, I created this kind of pattern where different cones would open and close um, along a grid matrix. And the first studies were just made out of poster board paper from the Dollar Tree, which I assembled together and then began to scale up with uh, core plast plastic. Uh, the colors unfortunately had to change. I would have loved to have done it in the bright pink and white, but they didn't have uh, pink plastic at the store. Um, and so you can see again in my apartment, I'm just assembling these pieces. Um, and what the pattern looks like is really this kind of opening and closing of the apertures of that grid pattern, as well as a shift in color. So you can see uh, at the top right, it is all yellow. And then at the top left, your left, my right, I'm not sure, um, it's all blue. And then kind of in the middle, you see uh, a mixture of the two creating this checkerboard pattern as they open and close. All these pieces were laser cut at a sign shop. So they all had to be organized, numbered, and cut um, out of these large sheets of coroplast that I brought home and assembled. Uh, and then again, installed into this storefront window for the uh, festival in Toronto. And here's just kind of a detailed shot of that. And you can see some of the, that there's this uh, white frame that it's all attached to, to hold the pieces together. So these studies really dealt with a lot of pieces and parts coming together to create pattern and design, dealing with light. And I really wanted to push these ideas back to the textiles that I was interested in earlier on. Um, and so I started to think about how I can make some of these same designs using pattern and textile and make them by sewing. So literally using the same grasshopper script from the previous project, I decided I would try to do this with a few more colors and out of a textile material that I would sew together. And this was a commission for a window front um, again. So it was like a very similar project. And all I did was change the material and the complexity of colors and shapes. Um, and you can see again here in Grasshopper all the pieces being laid out um, to cut and how much fabric was needed for that design. Uh, and here, again, sewing in my apartment was really difficult because this was huge. You can see I'm on the scissor lift, terrified for my life because I, I hate heights. Um, but it was all kind of crinkled up in this ball in my apartment as I tried to sew it all together um, and then got to sight and went on the scissor lift and was able to just unfurl it like a giant curtain. 
resultantly, the light coming through as it hits the fabric, which is super sheer, it's a really lightweight fabric, it just begins to create color and give this kind of kaleidoscopic feel um, of light. And you can see the depth of the material as it kind of shifts across. And here, just looking from, this is from like standing and looking up at the wall, because I believe it was somewhere like 36 feet tall. Um, probably a, pretty close to the height of this space. Um, so it was very amazing. The next project I started to work on with fabric was going back to aggregating parts, but working with testegrity modules. So this was a art festival in Buffalo, New York called the Echo Art Fair. And they took over this factory warehouse, um, which was actually still in use. It wasn't like an abandoned warehouse. Um, but they, the company that runs that warehouse moved all their machinery out for uh, one weekend for them to host this art festival there. And you can see the typical art festival booths down at the bottom with all the local galleries trying to sell work. But they wanted something to make the factory look a little bit more exciting rather than just a normal ceiling, but to create something decorative with inside that space. So this project, again, started with small scale models. Um, looking at tensegrity modules where I could replace uh, the pieces of string that are normally in a tensegrity module uh, with fabric and using those as the tension um, members. And then starting small, scaling up, um, and then also different iterations that I tried in the background there in my apartment. Um, and here's that design for the six strut tensegrity module, which then I used Grasshopper to figure out, okay, if I make 50 of these, how many uh, little clusters could I create and unique forms could I create on the ceiling to begin to map out a series of sort of constellations and different uh, designs that could be hoisted up um, and hung. Uh, and honestly, the purple color of it was a mistake. I actually filled out the form on the fabric website um, with the wrong number. So purple is not my favorite color, um, but this ended up being displayed like two weeks after uh, Prince died, so it ended up being really known as the purple rain cloud um, because of that, and it's like cloud clustery um, style. But here are all 50 of the pieces made, um, and then again, a scissor lift, my favorite, um, hanging it up there on the ceiling uh, in the empty warehouse the night before the exhibition opened, and there are those clusters. And when I did the rhino model, I thought these clusters were going to look much more isolated and independent, but really the depth of the space, the scale of them was much larger than I had um, kind of modeled. And ultimately, they really became this um, giant massive cloud in the space that dappled the light through it and created um, some really nice shadows and also created a, a place that where people kind of wanted to gather underneath and experience that space. Um, after that, I went to an artist residency, and if you ever get a chance to go to artist residencies, I highly recommend, um, because it's a, a great place to research and also build things that are not in your apartment. Um, so I had this beautiful cabin to work in um, as my studio space at the Birdcliff Artist Guild, which is one of the oldest colonies in Woodstock, New York. Um, and this was the inside of that space, and me starting to work inside that space, I think I spent about half of my time there just painting it white because it was so dirty to begin with and I wanted a white canvas to work with. Um, but then I wanted to lay out these strings within the space. Uh, and I was really interested in the connections of the windows from the inside of the gallery space or the studio space to the outside windows which saw into the nature and saw the light coming in, which was so beautiful um, because it was always dappled through the trees and the green. Um, in contrast to the white walls of that space. Uh, and working um, through this project, I was really inspired by one of Solowitz's drawings where he took every corner of the little objects on the wall, like the light fixtures and door frames, and connected them together in a drawing. And this, was, this drawing is at the Mass Mocha, which is not too far from uh, Birdcliff. And I wanted to do that in a three-dimensional way. So I took all the corner locations from these windows where the light was coming in and the views were being framed and began to connect them to each other across the room, 
to create a three-dimensional web of networks um, between those spaces. And here is me connecting um, these pieces of fabric in between those red lines of connection. And ultimately, it creates a way to break down the space and reframe those views that are coming in through the kind of rectangular windows and having a different way that the light begins to filter into the space and a different way to kind of break down the views. So as I worked with these projects, some of them were not very tactile. They were kind of separate gallery pieces. Like, obviously, you couldn't really interact with something on the ceiling. And so I was really interested in how, um, in the next phase of my work, I could really begin to create work with fabric where people could touch it, engage it, and feel it. Um, and so I started to push towards um, a different series of design and really dealing with play. Um, and playfulness. And so this was a project at the Boston Children's Museum um, on their kind of front lawn. And it was a bamboo structure with these fabrics hung inside. And it was intended to be an abstract playground um, for kids to climb through and run through. Um, and the fabrics here were studied at small scale, little models where I just began to move around and play with the different locations where the fabric could connect to create these hyperbolic forms, which were more dramatic than maybe a straight edge um, panel. Uh, I laid out that design with two different scales of cubes. So there's a three foot by three foot uh, bamboo cube and a six foot by six foot bamboo cube. And they were kind of randomly placed around to just have a dynamic structure. And then that is the result of the structure. And what you see in the background there is that uh, the Boston Museum of uh, Children's Museum had actually reached out to me because they really liked my inflatable domes. So that is how I got that commission. Um, and what I really liked about this project, again, was how the light came through it, but also how children began to kind of hang out with inside that space. Um, and use the fabric to support their body weight um, or that need to push and pull at the fabric to begin to navigate through it. Uh, so really adding that level of touch into the playfulness of the structure and thinking about how playgrounds um, are more than just swing sets where you have to swing and slides where you have to slide, but could be something where more imagination needs to take place in that level of engagement and tactility. Uh, the next project was for an all-night festival in Toronto. It's a festival that happens uh, several places throughout the world called Nuit Blanche. And it usually is from sunset to sunrise. So if you pull all-nighters in school, you're ready to pull all-nighters for an art festival. Um, because you, I did have to stay up all night and like hang out with my art piece and answer questions. And surprisingly, the people of Toronto are nocturnal because people were showing up to see my art piece at like 4 AM. Um, it was really fun and raining. Um, but the piece was kind of based on where the last project had the frame exposed, and you had to go um, and see the fabric hung within it. I wanted the frame to be embedded within the fabric, so you wouldn't see the frame anymore. So I started to play with the same kind of gridded frame. It's really just a PVC pipe frame. Um, and. The fabric is then stretched over it to create these kind of star shapes. Uh, and then there's lights embedded with it, within it so that it illuminates and has this really soft glow inside. Uh, and of course, you know, this time I didn't have space in my apartment to build the mock-up, so I actually built it um, outside in the backyard. Uh, but here's the kind of section and plan drawings, and what was really interesting about it is from one side, all the pieces kind of line up, and then the other side, the pieces are kind of blocking one another, and it creates a different dynamic form as you move around it uh, because of the way that the geometry is lined up around the triangular shape, um, and that this is really just a regular rectangular grid rotated at a 45 degree angle. And again, that fabric is wrapped on the outside of the grid so that it becomes these kind of sharp um, shapes, but they're somewhat soft because of the fabric. I'm using this kind of soft fabric that flexes as you touch it 
and it illuminates inside, so it has this quality of softness. And that is just the detail, again, trying not to reinvent the wheel. The joinery is just PVC joints um, with PVC pipes inside, and the fabric is just embedded within that. So they literally put the fabric off first and then put the joint over it so that it can be a nice closed system. Uh, and here it is in action. Um, sunset is starting, so the festival is just starting. And when people come up to it, they uh, tend to touch and feel the fabric and play with it. The colors change on different patterns. And there's also motion sensors inside that begin to make it a little bit brighter when people actually push the fabric and it starts to sense motion to it. Um, so it was very fun and interactive in that way. And it caused people to have to kind of push and pull and, and play with the fabric, as well as you could go inside. So to enter inside the structure, as these people are in here, you have to actually kind of crawl through this opening here. So you really have to, again, like push that fabric aside to begin to enter inside. And then once you're inside, you are surrounded by light, surrounded by color, and really feel immersed within this kind of separate space away from the crowds that are maybe on the outside of the structure. Uh, the same sparky like ge geometry that I was really interested in and these different shapes led to another project. But now I was trying to get rid of the interior structure so that you could actually go inside of those shapes. I wanted people to be able to experience them. And with the removal of the LED lights, I wanted the fabric to again use color. Um, so I went back to the same colors as the um, cubic structure from Boston, and you created these like star-shaped designs inside of this old school. Uh, and these are the different stars that I created, which are uh, each one has a different number of triangles, but all the triangles are the same size. So I only had to have like one size piece of fabric and cut it out just a different number of times and sew it together in different ways. Uh, and it was laid out in the room with enough space uh, for people to navigate around it. And I think what you're kind of seeing here is some strange uh, geometry and lines, but I was actually doing math to make sure that there's enough room for a wheelchair to navigate around and through these as well um, so that the space was perfectly open. But as, as well as allowing people to go around them, people can go inside and under them. Uh, and so the space itself became this very activated um, place where people would go underneath, uh, walk around and experience. Uh, and the walls were just covered in mylar um, to allow for reflectivity, to have the color kind of bounce around uh, within the space. And what I really loved about this project was then, instead of being outside of the color and, and seeing it um, kind of from an outside perspective, when you went inside of these spaces, you got saturated in color. It was overwhelmingly bright um, and really interesting. And you almost can look like a Warhol painting with all the different colors uh, as you go through each of the different structures. So that was really cool. Um, and it just how light kind of affects, especially when you look at my scarf. I'm wearing the same scarf in all three photos, but it seems like it, everything is changing color. Uh, so. I wanted to reuse that same fabric because I just, just didn't want it sitting in my closet. Like a lot of these art projects are in my closet, um, save for a later date. But I wanted to reuse this one. And um, particularly, the art park in Buffalo, New York, asked me to make a structure for their fairy festival uh, reusing these kind of shapes. So what I did was I just created a PVC structure to put inside of those same geometries um, to hold them up by themselves. Uh, and here they are in action at the Fairy Festival, where now kids use them as shading because the Fairy Festival is hosted usually on like the hottest day in July. Um, so just a way to reuse the same project. After all of these projects um, and dealing with buying fabric at the store um, in some of the largest amounts of fabric you've ever seen, I thought, well, what if the fabric could really be designed? What if I can create that fabric and make it really interesting and unique and specify different things within it? 
So it's focused on knitting because the difference between knit and weave is that knit is made with a row of loops. So you can see that on the image on the left there. And weaving is done with a warp and a weft. So it's less elastic. It doesn't stretch. Um, it only stretches as much as the yarn. And you can't really use that stretchy yarn. So I wanted to work with knitting for those reasons, as well as there's so many different stitch types that you can do for knitting, um, whether it's uh, knit and purl, or like a front stitch and rear stitch if you're using a knitting machine. Um, you can transfer the stitches to create different lace patterns and holes, um, and do different tucks where it holds the fabric for multiple loops and rows. Uh, and this is the knitting machine that I use, which is I have a domestic knitting machine, and it's pretty manual. Uh, it just has a thousand, a uh, hundred needles, um, and this little carriage machine here, which has all the different settings, like the stitch length, and um, feeds the yarn back and forth across to knit in rows, and you can create different patterns with that as well. And so here you can see some of my first samples where I'm just playing with different stitch types and playing with different textures and being able to get different ways to feel the material and, again, wanting people to interact with that material. And not only do stitch types give you different qualities, but also I've been exploring different yarn qualities as well. So different yarns will have different elasticities, and they'll create different reactions in the material as well. And playing with that, that I'm using even things from elastic yarn to fishing line to wire uh, and throwing it all in my knitting machine and testing out what happens. So it's very experimental in that way. But some of the first structures I built went back to the purple structure on the ceiling. So looking at uh, tensegrity modules again. And, and now if I'm programming that surface, how could I make this module less of just an object that's static, but actually something that could potentially move and shift. Um, and so again, designing in Grasshopper this structure and looking at actually the performance of it and how it actually can be something that might move and um, collapse. So looking at it as a deployable structure, uh, which some of you might know that the course I teach um, is deployable structures. And so what you see here is the Rhino model with uh, Karumba analysis to show where the fabric is strained um, as the struts rods are being expanded. So when they are shorter, there's no tension on the fabric. And then as they expand, the fabric pulls into tension and lifts the model up. Uh, and so here are kind of the different frames of that expansion and that final design for that tensegrity um, deployable structure. I then had the opportunity to go to another artist residency, so another great studio to work in to get out of my apartment um, and have a nice space to work. And what you see here is um, another study for tensegrity modules coming along. And so I was interested, in, instead of using linear struts, at using bent rods for the structure. And so here, um, you can see a few different studies. But the one in the middle I started to focus in on, which is kind of two C-shaped arcs from a straight rod, which are kind of bent into shape and pulled there and held in suspension between three pieces of fabric. I modeled this in Rhino um, at a much larger scale. Uh, and what I realized is that the pieces of fabric I wanted to create were much too big for my little knitting machine. And so I went ahead and had to break them down into smaller pieces that I could knit on my machine. Uh, but the intention was to take two of those structures and stack them on top of each other to create a helix. So those two pipes never actually touch each other, but are bent in a helix form and held into suspension uh, with the fabric. And here it is simulated in Grasshopper uh, so that you can see how that fabric would then begin to pull into tension. Uh, this isn't a video of the one showing the actual rods bending into shape. I have that as well, but I didn't have a video recorded of it. Um, 
but it's good to see how that fabric really pulls into tension. Each piece of those fabrics had to be designed in a different way because they had different force loads on them. And so I, each piece actually has a different shape when it was knit to react to those force loads that were being deployed. Um, so in the end, I think it was like 52 pieces of fabric in these different diamond shapes that I had to create. Uh, and so I started by first creating like a really small st scale study and then a slightly larger one and then really going up to the full scale. And these are um, 10 foot PVC rods um, that are bent into shape and then the first panel in the middle being put on and I'm still using strings here as the other panels to kind of hold it into support um, until I have all of the pieces made. But just to kind of test that prototype as part of the process. Uh, and then obviously I continued to knit for like a whole week um, to get all the pieces and ultimately was able to get two kind of chunks of this to stack up and you can see how quickly it was easy to assemble. I mean, it was sped up in the video, but quick, quickly um, comparatively to other structures that you might assemble. Um, but it's also super lightweight. So what I was really interested was that amount of volume that I could create with something that literally weighs like less than eight pounds. Uh, and here is the kind of different frames of that video and that process of assembling it. And again, I really liked the way that you could visually see the forces in the fabric, how certain pieces um, shape and stretch based on where the forces are being pulled through it um, and how you get these really flower-like little petal shapes for holes and the layering as the light comes through it. But I was also interested then how it moved because it was so lightweight and PVC is not an extremely rigid um, plastic. Um, when you touch it, it kind of refracts and bends and reflects uh, that action. And I was really interested in those ways that it responds to people and the way that your body could move through it because it was large enough where you could crawl inside and experience that space and touch it and it would wiggle and move in response to you um, as you move through it. So that was something that I began to play with while it was uh, displayed in the gallery at this artist residency. And these types of knitting were still done with kind of plain materials. And as I mentioned earlier, I was looking at how to combine different materials together. So I started to do some small scale research still with bent rods and combining different materials. So using some elastic yarns and um, regular acrylic yarns and cotton yarns and the different striations create different ways that the material wrinkles, bends or stretches um, within the design. And this led to some of the work that I was doing last year uh, with Sean Alquist in Michigan. Uh, so Sean Alquist has a knitting lab in his um, research center at University of Michigan and he's known for uh, working with kids with autism and other disabilities and creates sensory playscapes. And so I had the opportunity to collaborate with him and his PhD student to create an addition to one of the playscapes that he had previously designed, which are these kind of structures with um, stretchy fabric and lots of holes, uh, and use the digital knitting machine. So I didn't have to use my little manual machine anymore, but was able to program it all on the computer and just press print. And then the machine just basically prints out fabric um, kind of in the opposite way of a 3D printer where it layers material up, three, it uh, layers material into a, a sheet of fabric. Uh, and so here is the kind of modules that Yi Chin Lee, the other PhD student working under Sean Alquist was um, collaborating with me on. And the idea was we would create these soft three-dimensional Lego-like pieces that would plug into Sean's previous design. And so, we created this kit of parts, which has, uh, I think it's six or seven different types of pieces in different shapes with different yarns. And here we are uh, in warp speed, assembling it 
uh, getting the piece a little stuck, so some teamwork was needed there. Uh, but ultimately, what you see on the right is that it was really fun to plug these into Sean's structure, but it was actually way more fun to just wear them uh, and make costumes uh, because it, you just always want to put things on your head uh, and <laughs> try them on. And this was something we found a lot with visitors to the gallery when we actually had this displayed as well, is people were less interested in actually playing with putting them together on the structure, but way more interested in just putting them on their head and running around. But that leads to some of the final research that I'm doing now here as a fellow in deployable structures and um, the way that material moves. So again, I'm looking at these kind of expansion and contraction of the knit material and looking at different patterns and how they react and can expose color or hide color when they're open and close in different states. Uh, and these kind of lattice structures, which can also roll up into a hyperbolic structure. Uh, so this is what actually we did yesterday in my deployable structures class, is build these hyperbolic structures out of skewers. And so they just kind of collapse and expand. And even though it's all straight lines, uh, it makes a curved hyperbolic shape. And so with my work, I'm interested in how to add the knitting to that. And so in this design, what you see is that I've created little loops within the knit structure that the uh, rods thread through. And so uh, it doesn't need to be held together with uh, little hair bands, but actually is held together with the knit material and threaded through and ultimately becomes this tower structure. And here is a video of me actually creating those little loops for it. So uh, what is uh, technically in the knitting world called a welt, you take the few rows down from where you've knit on the machine and loop it back up um, onto itself so that it creates a little hole or, or pocket uh, within the structure so that you, I have a spot to thread those rods through. And it's really hard to video um, and work on the knitting machine at the same time. But ultimately, this is a small scale structure that can collapse all the way down and pop back up and it kind of works in a fun deployable way. And I'm currently working on a larger model that I have not um, completed and I'm not ready to share yet, but I definitely hope that you look forward to my progress on that and we'll see it soon. So if you want to see my progress, follow me on Instagram and thank you so much for listening to my talk at 46 minutes long. Uh, and now we'll take questions. No questions, awesome. I have a sort of question. I was really curious how you imagine these sorts of things being fixed to the ground, like in the real world at scale with human occupation. Yeah, so for the most part, a lot of my work deals with temporary structures. Um, and part of the research in deployable structures that I talk about in my class is not fixing to them, them to the ground because you want to travel. And we talk about things like disaster relief, festivals, um, emergency buildings, uh, and things like that, where you maybe don't have the opportunity to attach to the ground. Um, but of course, at times, uh, I've done other work where you do have to temporarily attach it to the ground. And so there are different mechanisms for that as well. Uh, but of course, scaling up is always the goal. But I don't see these as full-scale buildings, but obviously as smaller structures for festivals, um, disaster relief, and things like that. Other questions? Beautiful talk. I, I really enjoyed it. And it, when, I, when I was a student, I read a lot about Fry Auto. Yeah, of course. Uh, those are kind of historical things now, because that was back in the 60s. But, uh, you know, I also was a big fan of uh, Mr. Fuller, and I can see him with the pink hair, Kenneth Stelson. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, really beautiful. Like, was it the, the old ones that got you going in this direction? Um. I think it's a bit of both. Like, for sure, uh, Kenneth Snelson, Fry Otto, Buckminster Fuller are huge influences on me. 
Um, and I think using Grasshopper and other computational tools makes making some of those designs even easier than they used to be because Buckminster Fuller could do crazy math. I can't do crazy math. And so the computer helps a lot, computers. right? So I have a lot more aids than he used to have by computers and calculators and things. So I think that um, with the knowledge of what he was doing and then looking at like the tools now that make it so much easier to do that um, definitely is what led me in some of this direction. Uh, and also, I, when I was working at Clemson, uh, it's fairly close to Black Mountain College. And so I did visit there uh, where Buckminster Fuller used to teach. Um, of course, now it's a boys' school, but it, it was just kind of one of those historical things that was, you know, knowing that he yeah. was there and that I got to go there as well. Thanks, Virginia. I have a question maybe about kind of the creative practice side of things, about how you develop and sustain, expand the, the processes of creation and analysis that it's, it's largely self-directed work, though it's in service of commissions and, and other kinds of engagements, but the sort of long-term sustained creative practice that you're developing? Yeah, I think that you, what you see is, um, of course, it's they are commission projects that I'm getting, uh, but also every time there's a reflection or something on and building up from a previous project. So you saw these kind of shapes or geometries would be a characteristic that would uh, repeat and I would keep refining it and getting better at it or different materials or tools that I was using and I'd refine it and get it better and try to push those uh, limits. I think the biggest shift was probably from the window installation in Toronto, which was made out of plastic, and then shifting to making almost the same exact thing out of fabric. And that was like, again, a self-reflective challenge of like, I have this thing, I really liked it, but how could I do it differently, right? And so I think uh, I'm always questioning things like that um, and very curious about testing uh, the limits of something that I've created. So always trying to get bigger, better, um, different materials and different ways to display those kind of ideas. Hey, so I know that you had mentioned that this is like a temporary structure for the most part, but I'm wondering if you had ever considered using uh, more permanent materials other than fabric. Like I know that there's like a like metal mesh or like something that could fold and like expand as well? Has that had ever been considered? Yeah, I mean, I think that metal mesh is an interesting material to work with. And I did mention that some of the knitting I've done has actually been with wire. So I've knit um, parts of copper wire. I've tried to knit aluminum and some kind of uh, bending steel. I've also um, worked with other kind of metal materials as well on some projects that I didn't show here. Uh, but I think I was interested in moving to more temporary and lightweight materials for that reason, because I liked the lightness of them um, and didn't really feel that more permanent things were an interest in my practice. So it's really just a, a personal choice. And I can't say that that's going to stay that way forever, right? That's just what I'm interested in now. And as you can see, from this kind of presentation is my interests had changed through different phases and different um, points in my career. All right, if there's no more questions, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.